Hi. Uh, okay. I think it's good that I'll start because I'm not a writer. I just read as what was said before. And I'm just here to give a perspective from a mathematician about sci-fi. To be honest, I also don't always read sci-fi. I only read five fiction in general, and usually my classic. Uh, although I read Kumari, Kalvin, Cosmic Comics, as well as me, sci-fi talaga May title ko din na Tease of Zero. Dapat talaga sci-fi yun. And, um, ano pa? We! No, not yet. Hindi nga, mas, mas ano ako eh, mas nandun ako sa mga luma. Kasi unfortunately, nang undergrad ako. Kasi kulang ang GE ko. Uh, hindi ko nabasa lahat. I didn't have all the time in my life to read. So I'm now catching up. Like, I'm catching up with we. Yet, getting the Nyati. And, um, a ah, great new world. Possibly. Anyway, so, what I would like to share first is that when I was reading these um, stories, um, first of all, I read the foreword of one of the books, and I think I saw there that there was this anecdote where um, there was a time when he or she was a child, and when he read something that uh, Filipinos cannot write sci-fi, and or cannot be astronauts, I think. Tapos parang sabi niya, ah, no, kasi nga, kasi girl siya, something like that. No? Tapos parang sabi nung nagsulat ng forward, uh, I kind of agree, but not because of being a girl, but because you're a Filipino. Um, he was arguing that perhaps we cannot write sci-fi because we were not in the correct milieu to write sci-fi. In other words, we are not as trained as those people in the Western nations in science, kaya wala tayong masyadong masabi at hindi natin maihabi into a story. Um, well, and then in the next forward yata, I think I saw that, no, there's hope. Um, uh, sci and in fact, I hope, uh, if he or she hopes that that's a sign that indeed science literacy in the Philippines is uh, blossoming, if you will. Um, now, Although, there is also one comment from the foreword that says there is a bit of difference between the sci-fi here and the sci-fi in the other countries. For example, the greatest difference would be how Star Trek and Star Wars is a different kind of sci-fi than most of the stories I've read. Um, in fact, I think what, what I get as a trend from the stories is that what are we in the face of all progress? What are we humanity in the face of progress? In the rise of robots, in the rise of machines, in the age of space colonization and all. Um, is it good for us? Is, it, is this really what we want? For example, do we really want eternal life? I, I think I read that from Space and, uh, and Time. Um, so we, do you really want an eternal life? Do you want to live hungry but live eternally. Um, there's also this story where the mother died and she got replaced by a robot. Surrogate, yes. Oh, I like that story. That's, yeah, so can you replace someone with a robot? So, and there's also this, you know, Romeo robot, yung queer nga. The same thing, no? Wala siyang mahanap na outlet for his emotions. So he bought a robot for that. Okay. In other words, most of the stories, and yeah, yung jitni sa harap, yung jitni yung unang, what's the title of that? Masa yung unang, jitni nga, jitni blues, exactly, oh. So, yun naman, sci-fi, pero yung parang dating niya sa akin, still napaka-domestic ng issue. Ay, pupunta siya ng ibang lugar, parang dating pupunta ng ibang bansa, tapos, ah, I want to stay here. Okay, and I don't need the glamorous US, in this case, the glamorous new planet. Right. Okay. In other words, ang nakikita ko trend ay parang ano eh. Ano tayo? Okay ba sa humanity yun? Are we really okay with progress? Or is or rather, is progress really what we need? Parang in the end, is this what will matter to us? Right. Okay. Not like yung Star Wars, mas ano eh. And gera-gera, ganyan, tapos sakop-sakop na mga ano, tapos triumph in the end. It, 
X-Men din, medyo ganun, no? So, hindi siya yung nagdadwell on domestic issues or on emotions of your humanity. Okay, now, I'm not saying that it's bad or good, I'm just saying that, I'm just describing that that's what I'm observing. Okay, now, okay, what's my point of view? Well, from a mathematician, I think, um, writing sci-fi is a nice opportunity for fiction and for science because, well, what do you basically do with sci-fi uh, when you write sci-fi? You write something that does not, well, basically when you write fiction, most of the time you write something that's not there unless you are in that genre of fiction that you know, something that's there is in the Sulat Mon. Um, pero yung sci-fi, I think yung extreme, you don't even know if it will happen, if there will be a rise of robots or a rise of apes or whatever, and um, a rebellion of robots. Uh, but, ang tawag dito? But you write about that. In other words, you're writing something about that does not exist here. And you are looking forward that it might happen in the future. It's something that mathematicians do in an everyday basis. We always try to escape reality. In fact, I think Einstein himself said that, that when a scientist or an artist, yeah, he said that, scientist or artist does his work, it's not, it's, and he loves to do, to do that work because it's his way of escaping the menial everyday life of a working man. Art releases him from that. Science also releases him from that. Science opens his mind to new possibilities. And sci-fi, I think, does that, that same role in fiction. It opens you to new worlds, and well, you explore new worlds. Math is, math is abstraction. Uh, I think, for example, in my case, the reason why I took math and I took pure mathematics was I did not want to care about applications. I wanted to simply explore, okay, there's this puzzle and what could happen? I don't even know if it exists. But it's nice to solve this even if the equation exists on its own. Doesn't even mean anything here. Um, if you're a pure mathematics researcher, that's basically what you do every day. Um, exactly, you explore new worlds, you gather ideas from experience, but then after, and shackle these ideas from the fetters of reality. Um, I'm a geometer, so as she said, I am, one of my research interests is differential geometry. You don't need to understand the word differential, just the geometry is enough because that's the is differential, isn't it? I'm sorry. All geometry is differential. No, this is a different kind of difference, more like it's the kind of geometry that stems from calculus. Uh -huh. Anyway, so. <laughs> No, I don't want to dwell on that. Um, the reason why I took that was it's kind of the math stuff that a modern physicist might need. For example, in describing the universe, the shape of the universe and all, techniques from differential geometry, linear algebra, again, I don't want to dwell on that, are the ones that you have to use to solve Einstein's equation, for example. And um, yeah, modern physicists ask, what shape really is our universe? We modern geometers, tell them that, okay, here are some techniques to do that. And what we tell the physicists is, the world we thought we knew might not be the way it is. And why is that an important point? Long time ago, we thought that the world was like this, just like how our forebears thought the world was flat. That was their truth. And then when you said that the world was round or whatever, uh, you'll be accused as a crackpot or whatever. And then suddenly, in the future, oh, it's, he's right, the world is round. And therefore, what you should pick up from that is, uh, so even if you postulate something that might not be true now, you will never know if that will be still false in the future. In other words, it is always worthwhile to postulate something that is not yet true. Because you need to, who knows what truth really is? Okay, I want to think that. So, yeah. So, yan yung laging mga thoughts ng isang mathematician. Okay. Yeah. And especially if you're a mathematician, in fact, we don't even care what's true. 
Uh, we always postulate different worlds, and the physicist will choose, OK, but this is the real world. OK, and then centuries later, oh, no, it's wrong. This is the real world. Or maybe I have a more general world that is, and the current world I know is just a subset of that. But for a mathematician, no, it's just the structure that matters. This might be true, this might be not, but it's always worthwhile to explore it. We escape the real and explore other possibilities. New axiom systems, new rules, new truths within these new systems, new logics, in fact, and the infinite. We are finite beings, but it is only through the infinite that you can understand some things that you consider finite. I always tell my class when even when you were kids, you have already already encountered the infinite, and you had a grasp, a literal grasp of the infinite. Pi. Every non-terminating decimal, 3.14159, and so on. When the elementary teacher tells you, oh, this is a number, oh, you just believe him. It's like dogmatic. I tell, tell you that this non-terminating infinite decimal place number is a number finite number that you see, you use in a formula to find this whatever of the circle. So you accept it as something that's there, when in fact it uses a concept that is not here, something that's infinite, an infinite sum, an infinite number, and you accept it as finite. So is it a number or not? It's the same dilemma with this, I, I don't know, Middle Ages or Dark Ages, number is zero, or wala pang number negative one. Uh, middle age is siguro, no? So, is zero a number? Is nothing something? It's just like the question in philosophy, is nothing as being? So, uh, ang tawag dito? For example, there's this problem in math where it's a counting problem. You don't have to understand all the math. No? So, for example, I see five chairs in that room. And there's, a, for example, there's a problem you have five people and there are five chairs. And you wish to count the number of ways you can arrange the five people on the five chairs. Standard combinatorics high school uh, problem. And, well, it's a minus eight to 12. Okay, so, pag sinagutan yun, ang sagot dun ay that may limang chairs, kada isa may number of choices, tapos multiply pa lahat. May limang choices sa una, tapos once na naiupo mo na yung isa, dun sa remaining four chairs, for the next year, isa na lang, ah, four na lang yung pwede mong pagbibigyan. So you have four choices. Anyway, bang mangyari, five times four times three times two times one. May sabot yun. Lola. Now, if you modify the question, what if instead of five people ang gusto mong iupo sa limang chairs? Apat na. And usually students will have a long, hard time thinking of the answer. Ah, so case one, case one, what if chair one is empty? Case two, what if chair two is empty? Case three, what? And then you will add all the five cases. That was I will tell them. Oh, there's a, and then they will end up with the same answer. And then they will be of course befuddled. But why it pares sa what? In a bawasan yung tao. So arranging five people in five chairs and arranging four people in five chairs has the same number. Why? Why it walang effect yung nawalang isa? And then I tell them because yung nawalang isa ay hindi matagawala. You have, for example, you have you have Bernadette, Howard, Raj, Sheldon, and the fifth one who was originally Leonard, you know, I'm nobody. So nobody is actually somebody. You are to count the empty chair as someone is sitting on there. Nothing is sitting on there. Nothing is something. But anyway. So, the point of the story is that story is a problem, but it's a math puzzle. The point of the this dilemma of is nothing something was encountered so many centuries ago, and then now we take it for granted that oh, zero is a number. We accept it. It's in our number system. But long time ago, it was absurd to think of zero as a number. So, a lot of things that we might think absurd now, for example, there was a time of the Greeks when they called certain numbers irrational and imaginary, and there were real numbers. And then when you think about it, what number is real, actually? No num either, well, a mathematician's perspective is always, 
either all numbers are real or all numbers are imaginary because no one has ever seen a number. A number is an adjective originally, but then the mathematician made it a noun. It made it a concept. One is now an object, but then you don't see that object. You say one thing. You make you use it as an adjective at this, you, to, to describe something, and the mathematician transcended dimensions and said, I will make that adjective a thing, one. I don't have to. I can divorce it now from the thing that it describes. And yeah. OK. Uh, to a geometer, naman, the daily experience of getting out of reality is postulating a new world. There is a geometry that everyone knows when, you, when you're in high school. The geometry where the Pythagorean theorem is true, the geometry where, OK, from this point to that point, this is the distance, and I have a formula for that. Or, OK, I have this building, tapos uh, at this time of the day, kakapahaba yung shadow ng building na yun. That's your algebra and your geometry and trigonometry in high school. Now, when you're in research level, what you realize is, oh, I can have a world where all of this is wrong. And the question is, is this new world that I created, invented, what we now call non-Euclidean geometries, is this world real? Or in other words, is it worthwhile to study this world? But then what one realizes is in 1915, when Einstein published his paper on general relativity, people realized that, oh, so this geometry actually has an application. Apparently the universe as we know it was wrong. We assumed that the universe was flat and all, and that was the basis of all your high school geometry. And always, I tell my, my modern geometry class for math majors, in fact, what you have to do before you come into this class is you have to throw away all your biases and dogmas from high school. You have to unlearn everything in high school, because this is a new job, and I will introduce another new job. And I don't care which is true, because that's the point. We simply want to see these new worlds. Okay, so yeah, uh, we usually play with out-of-this-world theories without any regard with, it, with application. It just becomes a pleasant surprise that someday these theories become applicable to reality. Uh, even the idea of infinity, these did not make sense in Western thought. We can go, for example, to calculus. In calculus, there's always this idea of how do you divide something out of nothing? You can always divide a pizza uh, into two people. You can divide pizza into three people. Can you divide pizza into no people? And the answer is, how many people, no, no, no. How many, how many will share a single pizza if they have to have each nothing? There has to be an infinite number of people sharing nothing to get something. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> typical in the calculus, typical uh, uh, paradox in the calculus. Okay, infinitely, taking infinitely many nothings. Um, my point is, originally they didn't make sense. Historically, um, there was this I, uh, Catholic bishop, I don't know, Catholic bishop who accused mathematicians of saying, what is this you're saying? Is it nothing or is it there? Because that's a basic calculus, that's a basic the limit. If you're familiar with the limit, it's something that vanishes, but you're not yet at the point that it has already vanished. You're only looking at when it's about to vanish. But then that's, that's the, precisely is the problem with that. So what do you mean by about to vanish? So did it vanish or not? Then you're, 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 you're gonna say, no, it's just about to vanish. So it's there. No, I'm letting it go to zero. So, so what is it really? So is it zero or is it there? Is it nothing or is it something? Um, and now we're wielding that theory to analyze a lot of real phenomena. Uh, what else? Oh, okay. Now, in with regard to the issue of can we really write sci-fi because it appears that we have a different culture, it appears that we have a different training. Um, if you are going to ask a mathematician, in fact, 
You can because when, when you study math, that's when you realize that there are things in this world which are universal. Uh, mathematics transcends everything. <laughs> uh, cultures, time, worlds, in fact. You can go from the real to the unreal or, well, fictitious for now. Um, as I said, the trend that I saw in most of what I've read was, it seems that the, the concern of Philippine sci-fi writers is, what is what happens to humanity in the face of progress? It is not actually uniquely Filipino. Um, many writers write that way. As I've said, for example, um, nga, we, uh, by Evgeny Zamiante, now, who, by the way, is an engineer. That's an interesting tidbit. He explores the question, is it better that we are all the same? And it makes matters so efficient and harmonious. However, we have to sacrifice our individuality. So are we okay with that? Or, oh well, that's not the only fiction I know where I saw that. Individualism and independent thought cannot escape the eyes of Big Brother and will be persecuted in George Orwell's 1984. And the same dangers of a government will wielding too much technological power is explored in Brave New World by Huxley. And kung sasabihin nyo man, Western din. Uh, punta kayo medyo north lang natin, go to Japan. Nood ka lang ng anime. Ang dami nilang, actually, nakagawa ko sabihin CD, importante pa lang detail yun. May hindi ko mo mag-anime. So, for example, in the melancholy of Harry Suzumiya, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, there's this episode where she discusses if she's special or not. Like, okay, I brush my teeth, I wake up in the morning, Maritad, I wake up in the morning, then brush my teeth, blah, blah, blah. Every morning I do that. And then when I was a child, I thought I was special in the eyes of my parents. And then one day I went to this football stadium. There were so many people, an ocean of people. And then she asked her father, get that parami tao dito eh? Marami eh? Thousands, blah, blah, blah. Sino na ba lahat ng tao sa Japan? Tapos sabi niya, hindi pa. Isang stadium lang yun. Tapos, oh, saan so, lakit-lakit ng Japan? Tapos, eh, matagi na si Harry. So sabi niya, may regression proportion ako, nag-calculator ako, ngayon yan. Tapos, sobrang dami pa pala sa Japan. Tapos sabi ng tatay ko, hindi pa pala yun yung buong mundo. And then what she realized, therefore, is, so there's so many people in this world, I thought I was so special. And I do the same things these people do. So, is the individual special? Is the individual unique? There was this question. Okay, so, in other words, um, sometimes uh, we thought that we're not so good at things, but other cultures have the same dilemmas, and that's, and those dilemmas get into their sci-fi. Um, no, for example, the Big Bang Theory. There was this uh, discussion where Sheldon was thinking of being a becoming a robot. And so the question was, so how will he become a robot, or rather not become a robot? When he dies, uh, he wants that there should be a robot that will store his consciousness. So everything Sheldon will be in that robot. And the question was, so is that ro robot Sheldon or not? Would you consider that robot Sheldon? So. And well, I, I'm not sure. Hindi yata na set. Siyempre hindi na set yung tanong na yun. But my point is, or the same thing, um, do you consider the robot human enough by containing all the thoughts of Sheldon, all the attributes of Sheldon? In mathematics, we have that idea of how do you differentiate a halabaw and a tamarau? How do you differentiate any two things, in fact? How do you know that this person is different from that person? Kasi mag hindi sila magkamukha. Ibig sabihin, may parameters ka. You have a set of parameters, a vector of parameters, if you will. And then, okay, there are two components which did not agree. Therefore, they're not the same person. Magkaiba yung kilay nila. So, kung nangyong kata, okay. Now, in the case of the robot and Sheldon, if you assume that all the attributes of Sheldon were stored in the robot, so lahat yung vector na yun, matutupad. Vector ni Sheldon equals vector of the robot. So, are they the same person? Ayan ako ang pinagpapaisip ko sa inyo. Anyway, so yan. Yeah. Anyway, so, 
Ayun. Uh, yeah, the kind of sci-fi these anthologies have, in contrast to X-Men, Star Wars, Avengers. Oh, by the way, let me just say, catch naman si Budget, it's five minutes up. Um, in Avengers, for example, I don't, there's the characters Thor, right? And ano yung lagi pinag-aawayan nila ni Loki? Ano yung lagi inaago ni Loki? Hmm? Di nyo na Avengers? Yung te? Serac. Very good yan. Yung Tesseract. Tapos, so, uh, uh, ano uli yung silbi ng Tesseract? Diba? Pag pupunta sila sa Asgard, ang tawag dito, so kailangan nila para maka-enter dun eh. Parang pang bukas ng gigs yun. Now, my point is, do you know what a Tesseract really means? A Tesseract is not a fiction thing, a fiction word. It's actually a math object. A Tesseract is a hypercube. And what is a hypercube? Oh, you know, you know a square. A square is a two-dimensional thing na pare-parehas lahat ng size. Make it 3D, that's a cube. 3D is the world we think we live in <laughs> right now. Now, if you go 4D, that's the analog, the 4D analog of a cube, the hypercube. And I don't know what the, thought of the thoughts of the writer were, but I will bet that he made, he called it a test rack to attest to the fact that this is something that's out of this world. You live in a three-dimensional um, earth, and then in order to go to Asgard, heaven, you need that fourth dimension of the Tesseract. So that's the value of the Tesseract there. It's a very mathematical concept of something out of this dimension. So, yeah. And in, in, um, in a Renaissance, I think, painting, Salvador Dali painted Jesus Christ on a cross that is shaped like a hypercube na, na in split into a three-dimensional projection. And an interpretation of artists, I, oh, it's like, because this is the time that Jesus, after dying, goes to him. And so he transcends dimensions again. And, use, and therefore, Dali uses this idea of, okay, the hypercube enables you to go to the fourth dimension. And the fourth dimension is well, heaven, I don't know. Okay, so, you know. So, yeah. Ah, yeah. Again, another another manifestation that it's not unique to us. Oh, by the way, I keep on saying that humanity in the face of progress, that idea is not unique to us. I'm not saying it as a negative. I'm actually saying that that this is a testament that that idea is universal and we are able to build it. We can be like the science fiction writers of the other nations. For example, Wally. If you're familiar with the movie Wally, you know? so okay, no by one. Now everything is controlled by robots, and you don't have to do anything. Everything in the axiom already. Uh, you have food, you have shelter, you have oxygen, whatever. So yeah. Okay. So I I think all I want to say in conclusion is that it is not all about these future advancements. The advancements and inventions in the first place aren't our main goal. And I think this is also what I saw in those stories. Ideas of going in those directions were conceived out of the desire to ease humanity's pains and sufferings and grant us greater convenience. In other words, the goal is still the betterment of humanity, not just the creation of a robot. All these ideas of robots, spaceships, planet colonies were conceived to bring the human race to better conditions it's just that when you read the phrase, making the world a better place, we now mean by world, not just planet Earth, but the entire cosmos, or perhaps at least just our galaxy. To be able to write sci-fi is to explore an infinite of possibilities. And uh, let me end with a quote by Bertrand Russell, because tama tama may GE problems ngayon. Now, this is what Russell said. And Bertrand Russell was, by the way, a philosopher and a mathematician, so it's nice that it comes from him. I would not want to be under a dictatorship of scientists. And he also says that a university education's duties are to provide, first, technical knowledge, and second, wisdom. And Russell believes that wisdom is what you get from history and literature. In other words, science is not just the it's not the goal per se. Everything, in fact, science, the humanities, and all, these are just tools 
so that we can understand ourselves and we can make ourselves in a better, more convenient situation. So I think uh, that's all. Thank you.